Uh, but now, so let Robert, the Bannon trial starts tomorrow, and I've got this is going to broach into uh, Ray Epps, which we I, I don't know if, if, if you're good to talk about it, but we'll, we'll get there in a second. Bannon, okay, lots of questions, whatever you know, I'd, I'd love to pick your brain. He's going to trial now on the contempt of Congress indictments. It's either one or two charges of disobeying a, con a congressional subpoena. Has anyone else other than uh, Libby or whatever his name, Gordon Libby, ever been prosecuted? Or was Gordon Libby the only one convicted of contempt of Congress? Uh, there, there have been more people prosecuted, but in high profile political cases, it's very, very rare. So Eric Holder was held in contempt of Congress by Congress. Uh, the Justice Department never prosecuted him. The IRS official, the head of the IRS at the time, who was engaged in massive illicit invasions of privacy for politicized purposes, uh, equally uh, was in contempt of Congress, again, not prosecuted by the Justice Department. Uh, and, you know, the famously, that what led to Edward Snowden was uh, the combination of lies, including by Clapper and others, uh, to write to Congress's face. Uh, John Brennan repeatedly lied all the way through his tenure, including all the way back to spying on Congress itself. Again, none of them ever prosecuted. So I don't believe anybody in the Obama administration was ever prosecuted, even though many of them were clearly in contempt of Congress. Uh, often, in my view, what contempt of Congress should be limited to, should be restricted to, is the uh, is really criminal obstruction. In other words, lying to Congress in a material way, uh, you know, forging documents that could impact the legislative process. Uh, the there was nothing that uh, Steve Bannon did that, in my view, could have even possibly impacted the legislative process. And just contrast it to Pfizer's defense and the, the Civil False Claims Act we're bringing on behalf of Brooke Jackson and the American people, where they say that, yeah, maybe we committed material lies to the de uh, Defense Department, but it doesn't matter because they didn't choose to do do anything about it. And so that means that nobody should be able to sue us over it. So you contrast what's really material versus what's really immaterial to their legislative task. They haven't shown that, but they've liberalized and loosened the laws. Congress gets to write these laws in the first place. Uh, and it's why there, there shouldn't be this kind of broad, vague uh, provisions like this to entrap effectively people like Steve Bannon. He was out last week saying it's basically just a show trial. It, 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 uh, in D.C., you cannot get an impartial jury. That's been proven over and over and over and over again now for six years running. Uh, the ban and trial will be more revelation of that. I don't believe the CNN did a hit piece on him today, right as the jury is being uh, selected tomorrow. And it's, uh, I believe, uh, Joe Nearman, Good Logic, uh, L A W G I C on YouTube. And it's, so it's found, sounds like logic in parts of Brooklyn and New York, <laughs> uh, which Mark Robert and others could speak to. The is that uh, uh, he's going to be there in person uh, part, uh, covering the case as well as some others. It's a federal trial, so that means it's not televised. The I assume we'll see how many witnesses uh, Bannon's defense is allowed to present. The judge, feeling bound by precedent, uh, has basically gutted all of his defenses so that he's not allowed to say, I did this upon advice of counsel. He's not allowed to say, I did this because my understanding of executive privilege meant it was not a legitimately issued subpoena. Uh, he's not allowed to present his defense that he did not understand it to be a legitimately issued congressional subpoena because this committee was not properly formed under the rules of Congress, which is supposed to be an element of the offense. The judge has voiced criticism of some of that prior precedent and says that, you know, some doubts about it. But effectively, at this point, he's going to trial to show what a show trial looks like in D.C. and going to trial to preserve his appellate remedies on these issues. But it's uh, at this point, as his own lawyer said in court, he doesn't really have any defenses available to him. So the the judges stripped him of it. Apparently, it may be a pretty short trial. It will be was a subpoena issued, was a subpoena responded to. End of story by the by the interpretation of the law uh, as it's currently constructed. And I believe it's misconstructed. Uh, but it also shows the problem of the Justice Department, a bunch of political hacks who run the D.C. division, who have politically weaponized the case in a very selective way, as they have all the other January 6th cases. As we saw this week in what was a meme, you know, grandma's getting arrested and sent to prison for walking around the Capitol without special permission from Nancy Pelosi. Uh, actually, an elderly woman was sentenced to two months in prison and for just for doing just that, walking around without permission of Speaker Pelosi, 
Um, and even though she has cancer, contrast that to the lawyer who deliberately lied and perjured information, obstructed justice, created a false statement to the Foreign Intelligence Sur uh, Surveillance Activities Court in order to illicitly spy on Americans for politicized purposes. One of the worst offenses you can do. He served no time. But an elderly lady who has cancer is sentenced to prison for two months uh, by this uh, Justice Department and by this judicial system in the District of Columbia. Uh, which should be just named the District of Corruption, uh, and and for simply something as a misdemeanor trespass on the Capitol's grounds. We're, we're going to get to the comparison, not just to Kleinsmith in a separate case, but to Ray Epps in this case. But something I don't understand, Robert, the Judge Nichols, a Trump appointee, so nobody can you know, arguably claim political bias, has stripped Bannon of his defense of professional reliance, understanding of the law, uh, the one that I uh, and arguing that the committee itself is not properly formed. Now, th that House Resolution 503, whatever it is that formed the House, said that the committee shall must be comprised of a certain number of, of, of individuals. And it's not. So how how is he not allowed to raise that as an argument? These are arguments that affect mens rea and also actus reus. How is he not allowed to raise them? And do they become issues for an appeal if, you know, to the extent they're properly saved? Uh, there are definitely issues for appeal. The judge found that uh, he did move to dismiss on those grounds and the judge denied it. And so the I disagree with the judge's decision in that regard. Uh, the D.C. judges have uh, almost none of them have shown the ability to be consistently impartial in these cases, even the Trump appointees. Uh, it was a uh, I believe a Reagan or maybe Bush appointee that sentenced that old lady to, to prison. So the uh, if you're in the District of Columbia, you're they're just they, they I've said from the beginning, neither the judges in D.C. nor the juries in D.C. nor the prosecutors in D.C. are capable of being impartial. They're politically motivated. They're politically prejudiced. They feel personally attacked by what they interpret January 6th to be. And consequently, they're unreliable. And, you know, the the fact that, that someone's a Trump appointee doesn't always say a whole lot. It says that maybe maybe they'll be good. But no guarantee they'll be good. There's a Trump appointee in the Brooke Jackson whistleblower case, uh, and he lectured me about tweeting about the case. So, I mean, that that tells you a lot. I mean, President John Kennedy appointed Curtis LeMay, bombs away LeMay to the Joint Chiefs of Staff early on in his presidency. And many people believe he was complicit in the assassination of President Kennedy. So JFK and Trump shared that in common, making some very uh, dubious appointments along the way. And Trump, the fact that a judge has been a Trump appointee has been no protection for constitutional liberty, sadly, with any degree of consistency. They tend to defer to corporate power. They tend to, I mean, like, they, did they intervene in OSHA? Sure, but that was between big corporations and the government. Um, so they've been good on religious liberty in, in many contexts, but they have not been a consistent voice on a lot of other cases, particularly if it goes up against the Justice Department or goes up against corporate America. They sadly have more of a Federalist Society bet, which is their definition of conservatism is country club corporate conservatism. What serves those interests of the privileged few, not those that serve the broader mass, especially and if it involves uh, uh, even if it involves constitutional liberty at stake. So that's uh, that he the fact that the Trump appointee is no protection for Steve Bannon in this trial. Uh, it'll just be used as the talking point on the other side that that's how that's how obvious this case is. Even a Trump appointee struck struck or stripped Bannon of defenses in law. So th those could be grounds for an appeal. Fine. The triers of fact, the jury don't opine on questions of law. Another question people are asking, Bannon agreed to testify. He, he purportedly, whatever privilege, executive privilege he thought was bestowed to him, he says has been lifted. He's prepared to testify. Uh, can you explain to those who may not understand why that doesn't relieve him of the charges of contempt of Congress? Because it's uh, so he agreed to testify before the committee and provide evidence to the committee uh, belatedly. And he's not been if they if he had been charged with civil contempt, that would suffice because of civil contempt, you can purge your contempt by compliance. But he's been charged with criminal contempt and criminal t contempt is completed at the time that you don't pr provide the answer or the information. And so you can't cure it. Uh, criminal contempt is not subject to curation. 
And so that's why uh, that didn't really achieve anything. It's not clear if his lawyers gave some bad advice along the way. Uh, uh, Bannon has chosen to often go with your corporate white shoe counsel types. I've always considered that generally a mistake in politically motivated cases. Um, and because it, it doesn't appear they got clear communication from Trump, Team Trump, to assert executive privilege as a basis to resist the subpoena. It appears that uh, that certain information may have been given to Bannon that was incorrect. We don't know. But unfortunately, none of that is a defense to his criminal contempt charge directly. Um, OK, and now, I mean, like, I, I don't want to be pessimistic. In my mind, Bannon's going to jail for this. There's like, even though, even though there's a one month minimum for the charge, a one year maximum, there's a small fine or a big fine. A grandma, like people need to appreciate this. We're going to dovetail this into the Ray Epps, but uh, an elderly grandmother woman is going to jail for two months for her role in January 6th. They're going to unleash the, the fury on Bannon. Question, Robert, I mean, you know Bannon better than me, certainly, but better than most. Is this, does he want to go to jail to make a point? Was this part of proving how corrupt the system is? Or did he just get caught uh, biting off more than he can chew or gambling more than he could lose? I don't know. Uh, to be honest with you, I don't know uh, what his objective has been throughout this. It's not been crystal clear. So the, uh, uh, I mean, I think this judge wouldn't issue a high sentence. I mean, from a sentencing guidelines perspective, the, the statutory minimum is the only thing that would make sense. Um, I think normally be a probationary offense. So if, if there's a one month, one month statutory minimum, that would be all that would likely be given. Um, the, and then he could grant bail pending appeal so that there's no imminent risk of imprisonment with this judge. Uh, I don't think that this judge is likely to issue a, a sentence that he doesn't grant bail for. Uh, and then he's looking at several years and most likely it's uh, uh, before the Supreme Court and all of his rights and remedies and relief has been uh, exhausted. Uh, likely there's a new president in January 2025. And if it's uh, Donald John Trump, uh, whose ex-wife and the mother of his uh, three, uh, three of his uh, five children passed away, sadly, this uh, this past week. Uh, if it's Trump that's in the White House, then uh, uh, Bannon will be pardoned once again, in all likelihood, because Trump has said that January 6th has become such a joke of justice that he intends to pardon everybody uh, connected to it uh, that has been political because it's been such an overt, open uh, political weaponization of the process, which is revealed by the cover story that the New York Times was writing this week for oh, one Ray yeah. Epps. Who's I was the only one really on tape admitting criminal conspiratorial behavior the night before and magically and miraculously is the only one not being prosecuted by the Justice Department for January 6th. Let me see if I can bring this article up while I do it. Uh, this week, Robert Govea, Good Logic, myself will be covering Bannon. Uh, good Logic is the only one going to be down in Washington for the trial. Robert Govea is going to get the transcripts and do the night stuff. And we're probably all going to be uh, inter collabing, I guess, at some point. So stay tuned. And I'm going to be doing some exclusive commentary analysis for the post millennial. So stay tuned for that as well. But Robert, Ray Epps, 